Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Glad to see everybody this morning, and welcome. Uh, just, it's still a beautiful day with that rain outside. I just enjoy being in the Lord's house. And if you're a guest here, we do want to thank you for joining us this morning, and we're just excited for you to be here. We do hope you feel at home. We want to learn how we can connect with you and how we can serve you, and, and most importantly, how we can pray for you. So we have Connect cards, and they're out in the foyer or over in our Welcome Center. And if you'll just pick up one of those cards and fill those out, and then after the service this morning, go over to the Welcome Center. There'll be somebody waiting there for you, and they have a gift for you there. And also, we want to welcome everyone that's watching online at home. We're just thankful that you can join us, and uh, it's been a, just a neat experience to see folks from many different states just join us online and, and watching. So thank you for being with us. And I want to share a verse with you this morning. It's from the book of Luke. It's chapter 7, and it's verse 23. And it says, And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. And in this world today, there's a lot of offended people. And I thank God I'm not offended because of Jesus. Blessed are we if we're not offended because of Jesus and what he does for us and all the, all the ways that he loves us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you again for today and just thank you for the blessing of coming together. Thank you for being blessed, Lord, because of you. And Lord, I pray as we go into this morning that you are lifted up in everything that's done and every word that's spoken, that you are lifted up, Lord, because you deserve all the glory. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see everybody. Hope you're having a good day. Let us stand as we sing this song. This is a shout to the Lord. Uh, I believe when the Lord comes back, he's going to shout for us. So it's time for us to shout to him. So let us sing. Jesus, my Savior, come and earth and you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower
Good morning. We are so glad to see you here on this wonderful Lord's Day. We've come to worship King Jesus, who we have so much to shout about, don't we? And uh, when you stop and think about simply who God is, there's so much to praise him for. And then you add into what he's done for us, even more to praise him for. And uh, we're so thankful that we can come as a body of Christ and worship today. And we're glad you're here. As we begin several celebrations, we want to give God praise for recognizing several couples in our church celebrating wedding anniversaries this week. First off, congratulations to Josh and Jennifer Taylor. They celebrated their 18th wedding anniversary on Monday. So let's praise the Lord for them. Amen. We praise God for them. Then also congratulations to Dustin and Megan Reeves. They celebrate their eighth wedding anniversary on Tuesday. So praise the Lord for them. And we're excited for them. And then also congratulations to Scott and Beth Chambers. They celebrate their 12th wedding anniversary on Wednesday. So again, let's praise the Lord for them. And we are just excited to see what God is doing in the life of our families, and we praise God for these wedding anniversaries. We also want to praise God. It's good to have Joy, Joyce Glenn back with us this morning, and of course, Joe, too, but, but uh, we're thankful she's feeling well enough to be with us. She's still recovering from those broken ribs. We're still praying for this PET scan coming up. It's been scheduled for April the 14th, I believe it is. May, May the 14th. I'm, yeah, we're past April the 14th. May the 14th. Thank you. So, so we're past that. But uh, May the 14th is when we should have this PET scan. So we just uh, know God's in control. But we're so thankful to have them both here with us this morning. And thank you for loving on them and praying for them. And please continue to do so. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we're so, so good to see you all this morning. And then thank you for praying for Doris Gresham. She had that uh, procedure in her leg on, on Monday. That went well. So we just praise the Lord for that. So do continue to pray for her as she recovers. And I uh, want to say thank you for praying for Ingla Gilly and, and Jamie and, and the kids and their family. She had a doctor's appointment on Monday. And praise the Lord that the cancer is contained to her thyroid. It is not spread anywhere else. There was concern it was spread to the lymph nodes, but it's not in the lymph nodes. And so uh, she will have that thyroid moved in May, so we just uh, praise the Lord that it's not anywhere else and they can remove that. And so we want to continue praying for England and Jamie and the kids in the days ahead and be praying for that surgery coming up. And then if you would pray for Bernard and Ann Day's daughter, Tammy, she's been having some uh, quite a bit of health issues and the doctors believe that some of the issues have been caused by a dead nerve in her spine. And so tomorrow she's going to have surgery to put some kind of device in to help with that, that dead nerve and hopefully take care of some of these health issues that she's having. So pray for Tammy as she has a surgery tomorrow. Pray for Bernard and Ann and, and the rest of the family, and we just want to pray that God's blessed upon the surgery tomorrow. And then if you would, pray for Alyssa O'Brien. We've been praying for sweet little Alyssa uh, with all that she's going through. Well, this Thursday, she's going in to have a permanent J feeding tube put in. They call it a J tube, and so uh, this will prevent her from having to have it switched out by being put under and everything in the years to come, And but uh, they can do all this at home, so they can uh, adjust this. So it's a different type of tube they're putting in, and so we just pray that all goes well. And then uh, just want to make parents aware. In just a moment, our children are going to be dismissed for children's church. You're going to see the slide go up. They're going to go out. Parents, let me encourage you to send your children to children's church today. As we're continuing studying through the book of 1 Corinthians, we're coming to chapter 5, and Paul deals with a very sensitive topic. And so I just want to encourage you to send your kids to children's church. Don't get scared, all right? It's just a topic I think would be better that we not open a bunch of can of worms for y'all. So just trying to help you out a little bit in the week ahead. So just want to encourage you to send your kids to children's church this morning as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful and thankful just to come and worship you today, and we are thankful even though it's raining outside, it's still a wonderful day because it's a day that you have given us. And Lord, you know exactly how to refresh your creation and with rain, and you know when we need rain, when we don't need rain, you give it to us. And Father, we're mindful of what you do in our own lives, how you refresh our lives day in and day out through your spirit, through your word, through the blessing of being part of a wonderful family of God here at Red Mountain, Father. And Father, I just pray that you have been glorified thus far. You will continue to be glorified. And Father, we just praise you for what you're doing in the lives of people here in our midst and in our community and around the world. Father, we thank you for these three couples that celebrated wedding anniversaries this week. And we pray your continued blessing upon them, Father. Father, it's so good to see Joyce and Joe with us this morning. We thank you that Joyce is feeling well enough to be with us this morning. I know she wanted to be here, and we prayed that she was able to come, and, and you answered that prayer, Father. <clears throat> and I just pray you continue to heal her from these broken ribs. 
And Father, as she has this PET scan coming up on May the 14th, Father, we just pray uh, that you just continue to give them the peace that surpasses all understanding. You already know the results of this, Lord God. So we just trust you. I know Joe and Joyce and the family are trusting you to take care of her. We do pray you do the same. Let your will be done. And we pray we do the same. Let your will be done in her life, Father. We just uh, know that you will watch out for her. We thank you for that. Father, we thank you for answering prayer in Doris's life. We thank you that procedure on her leg went well and she's recovering well. Father, we thank you that England had a good doctor appointment this week and the cancer is contained to her thyroid it hasn't spread to the lymph nodes or anywhere else and we just praise you that they can go in there and remove that and we just pray that that surgery go well when that time comes and father we just pray for tammy's surgery tomorrow and Alyssa's surgery on thursday father we just pray you be in the midst of those procedures and you guide the surgeon's hand guide the doctors and nurses that are ministering to to them father and we just pray that everything goes well and be successful and accomplishes its purpose father and father as we continue this time of worship may our focus be on worship you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Dave sort of got me wanting to go to children's church. <laughs> I'll be ready. Um, <clears throat> I don't have much of a voice, but the words are important. So I, I hope that um, they mean to you what they mean to me. I've had friends that walked away And I've even lost myself a time or two There were bridges crossed and burned But through all the wreckage I have learned There is one thing that I could never lose If I got Jesus I've got all that I could ever need Take the world away from me And I'll be okay If I got Jesus There's a hope that's living deep inside A joy that I could never hide And a safe place to fall If I got Jesus I got it all I've seen weakness turn to strength And I've seen failures met with grace And it's not from what I've done It's Christ in me A miracle I can't explain Oh, He's given me His name I'm the richest man that I could ever be If I got Jesus I've got all that I could ever be Take the world away from me And I'll be okay If I've got Jesus There's a hope that's living deep inside A joy that I could never hide And a safe place to fall If i got Jesus i got it all Someday that trumpet's gonna sound And the King of Heaven will ride upon the clouds Coming down I'll hit my knees, oh Lord, then sings my soul I'm going home If I got Jesus I got all that I could ever need Take the world away from me And I'll be okay If I got Jesus There's a hope that's living deep inside A 
joy that I could never have and a safe place to fall if I got Jesus I got it all if I got Jesus I got it all mm -hmm. Got it all. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Cameron. And how true that message is. When you have Jesus, you truly do have it all. I'll tell you, I'll take his bad voice any day over my good voice. So uh, <laughs> we're just thankful, God. Yeah, you know, Pastor Cameron's out all week among all this pollen and everything. You see all the pods in the ground and stuff. And so I appreciate him singing this morning in the midst of dealing with the, the, the voice issues he's having. But we are just thankful to have Jesus and what a difference that makes in our life. So if you haven't already done so, take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Corinthians. We're beginning chapter 5 as we're continuing our series of the book of 1 Corinthians. And uh, like I said, don't get scared. I just didn't want the kids in here, and you be calling me this week, why didn't you warn me? And you're, if you know what I'm talking about, you'll see in a minute when we read the text, probably why you realize I probably didn't want you to have to open that, that can of worms to be open, you have to deal with that later in the week and everything like that. But uh, we're, we're just looking at the first eight verses today. As you deal with this topic, you see it on, on the screen, the right way to deal with sin in the church. You know, there's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. That reminds me of the first car I had back when I got my first car. It was a 1979 Cutlass Supreme. I don't even know if they make those anymore. I don't know, but uh, they shouldn't if it was like the one I had. I'll tell you that. So, but I was blessed. It was, it was what I could afford. I was buying it from a guy at church and paying him $100 a month until I paid it off. And, and, I, and I just didn't know about, much car, know about cars that much and maintenance on cars and everything like that. I mean, I just needed to get a car, have a car to get me from point A to point B. And I thought that's all you needed. Just put some gas in it, you're good to go. So thankfully, I had a friend that knew a little bit more about car maintenance than I did. And so after about having the car a little bit over a year, he asked me, he said, how often have you changed your oil? To which I said, well, why would I need to do that? <laughs> exactly. So, you know, I just didn't know much about car maintenance. So my friend Jason, he was gracious. He, he told me why I needed to change my oil. In case you don't know, if you don't change your oil on a regular basis, you could do some damage to your, to your car and make it not run as well. Um, but he taught me to change my oil on, on, and how to change it on a regular basis. And so I wouldn't do any damage to my car. Uh, but, you know, it had only been over a little bit of a year. And I don't know when the previous guy changed the oil, but we went to go change that, that day. And that oil filter was so sealed to the, to that gasket was so sealed on the engine that we drove a screwdriver through it so we could get leverage on it and spin it. So I don't know how long that oil filter had been on there. But, but thankfully, I didn't do damage to my car. Um, but, you know, we got it done in time. You know, but I realized there's a right way to take care of cars. Otherwise, my car would have suffered the consequences. And the same is true in our lives if you think about it. The same is true in a church. There's a right way, to, a biblical way, to deal with certain things in our lives, to deal with certain things that happen in the church. And when, if we don't handle these things the right way, the biblical way, then we're going to suffer the consequences. And that's what's happening here in the church of Corinth that Paul is addressing this topic this morning. Um, let me just ask you this. Have you ever been reading through Scripture and, and, and all of a sudden you come across a passage and you think, wow, I can't believe that's in the Bible? Um, you know, and so, you know, one of the benefits of preaching through a book, and it, it forces me as your pastor and as a church to study what God's Word did, it gives to us. I mean, if it's in the Bible, obviously God wanted us to have it for a reason. And, and, and if we just pick and choose the text we like, we're not probably going to deal with texts like 1 Corinthians chapter 5, like we're dealing with this morning. But it's a, it's a topic and a text that we need to deal with. And, and 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is one of those things where people read it, they might say, wow, really? That's there? That's in the Bible? I mean, this is wild stuff we're looking at here. But, you know, we have to realize that this isn't typical of everything that's in the Bible. But God put it there for a reason, and we're going to learn why God has put this in the Bible. So stand with me in honor of reading God's holy word. And you're, you're probably thinking, get on to it. I want to know what he's talking about here. So let's look at the first eight verses of chapter 5 here in the book of 1 Corinthians. Paul writes this, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. You're welcome, by the way, for sending your kids to children's church. And he goes on to say, And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned. 
and, and <clears throat> excuse me, that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For indeed, excuse me, for I indeed, as absent in the body but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your glory in is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may... Excuse me, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. And for indeed, Christ our Passover has sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Father, this morning, as we dive into your word, some people say, well, this isn't a topic we should address in church. Lord, if it's in the word of God, it has to be addressed in church. So, Lord, as we look at this topic Open our minds and our hearts to be sensitive to sin. Because that's what Paul is addressing. He's addressing sin within the church. But Lord, let us not look at others around us. Let us start by looking at ourselves. And see if there's sin in our life that we haven't dealt with. But also let us see the seriousness of sin. How it doesn't just affect our lives, but affects those around us. How it affects your church, Father. And let us deal with sin in the church the right way. The biblical way. Let us deal with sin in our lives the right way, the biblical way. So, Father, I pray that you challenge us through your word this morning, that we will examine our lives and see if we line up with it. Father, that we will be more Christ-like by encountering your word this morning. Holy Spirit, empower me and preach through me this message. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So Paul has spent the first four chapters carefully uh, laying the foundation for what he's going to say and why he's going to say it. And finally, here in chapter 5, he begins to focus on the primary purpose of his writing. He begins shedding light on some very serious sins that were happening there in the church of Corinth. He begins addressing these sins that need immediate attention to, to be dealt with. And they need to be handled not just what society says. They need to be handled the way that God says. They need to be handled the right way. What we would say is the biblical way. And so the first sin that he addresses is a doozy here. And look, look again what he says there. He says, it is actually reported. What, let's just stop right there. What that means is it's widespread. It's commonly known. This is not a secret. Everybody, not just the church, but look what he says. Everybody in the community knows this. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. So the first sin on the docket is to be dealt with that Paul deals with is sexual immorality. It's a word there in the Greek, the word porinia. It's where we get our word pornography from. And what, what it means is it's illicit, unbiblical, ungodly sexual sin is what Paul is talking about here. It's an inclusive word. It's not exclusive. That means it includes sin of the body, sin of the mind. It includes adultery. It includes homosexuality. It includes lust. It includes fornication. And you could just add all the list of sexual sins in there. This specific sexual sin that Paul is referring to was, was so depraved that even those outside the church weren't doing it. That's how wicked this was. That's how gross it was to them. They, they're like, well, that's, we're not doing that, you know? Now, that's saying something because you think about Corinth. Corinth was a place of sexual debauchery. I mean, you know, you just go there and you could, you could fulfill any fantasy you wanted, basically. But they weren't even doing this sin in the city of Corinth. Paul says that those out the side of the church wouldn't even dream of doing this. In other words, they were, the, the people in the church were out sinning, if you will, the lost people outside the church. That's a sad state for the church to be in. So what exactly is a sexual sin? Look what he says there, that a man has his father's wife. So get the image here. Here's a professed Christian man within the church that has a sexual relationship with his father's wife. Not only is that wrong, but let's just be honest, that's just gross. I mean, that's, that's real. That's gross. Now, fortunately, it doesn't appear to be his biological mother because it says his father's wife. And so what that means is he's talking about his stepmother here. But notice that word has there, the verb has. It's in the present tense, and it means that this is a continual present action that's taking place. This wasn't just a one-night affair. 
This was an ongoing sexual relationship with her. This guy is not sorry. This guy is not ashamed. This guy is not hiding it. This guy is not in counseling for it. This guy is proudly flaunting his sin before the church. He's proudly flaunting his sin before the community. This is blatant, flagrant, unrepentant sin that's taking place within the church. And apparently, the stepmom is not a believer. The stepmom is not involved in the church because Paul doesn't deal with her. So not only is this man living in flagrant sin, but he's living in flagrant sin with an unbeliever, which magnifies the problem of a believer living just like an unbeliever. This sin, now listen to the damage this was doing. This sin was causing the character of the church of Corinth to be compromised. This sin was causing the witness of the church there in the city of Corinth to be weakened. Because they were allowing this to go on and not dealing with it properly. So Paul is writing to help these Christians understand that the people of the church, that they must take sin seriously within the church. And so Paul begins teaching this young, immature, remember this church is divided, this congregation, how to lovingly handle this guy. How to handle this guy who's living in unrepentant, flagrant sin before the church. Now this isn't just talking about struggling with sin. We all struggle with sin. This isn't calling Christians to go out there and be the sin police and make a report back to the spiritual leaders of the church. But this is how the church of Jesus Christ is to deal with believers in the church who are practicing blatant, flagrant, I can't even say the word, unrepentant, public, habitual sin and not repenting about it, not caring about it, and everybody knows about it. And so Paul shares us the right way to deal with sin within the church. He gives us three specific practices here. Now, my hope is to get to all three this morning. But I'll be honest with you, I've got a lot of notes. I told Scott Storm in the PowerPoint about there, I said, I'm sorry, there's a lot of scripture we're looking at this morning too. Because this is a serious thing in churches all across the America today, in churches across the world. But let's dive in. First, in order to deal with sin the right way in the church, we have to, number one, we have to grieve over sin. If we're going to deal with sin the biblical way in the church, we have to actually grieve over the sin. Look at verse 2. Are you puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you? Now, it may surprise you, but the biggest problem in that church was not that this member was having sex with his stepmother. The biggest problem was that this church was somehow taking pride in their tolerance they were showing this guy. They were being tolerant of this guy, and they were prideful about it. They weren't just ignoring it. They were prideful about it. They were arrogant about it, how tolerant they were. Now, if you're like me, you think, you know, your first reaction might be, why would they be puffed up over a church member that has, that's having this uh, very indecent and sensuous relationship with his stepmother? Well, they were, pride, they were prideful about their open-mindedness. I mean, how often do we hear that in churches today? Let's just all be open-minded. Well, the Corinthians were open-minded, and look what they're dealing with. They, they were prideful about the patience they were having with this sinner. And that patience turned into tolerance. And their tolerance turns into permission for it to take place. Does that sound familiar? That is what's happening in America today. That's what's happening in the world today. That's what's happening, sad to say, in churches all across this land. Now, we must understand the mindset of the Corinthian Christians at this time. Now, remember, this is a new church. And they're very thankful for their newfound freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ that Jesus has set them free from the bondage of sin. But unfortunately, they had mistaken their freedom in Christ for a license to sin. They saw it as a license to sin. We know this because Paul quotes a favorite phrase that was quoted in, 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 in uh, Corinth, and he seeks to correct them. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul writes this, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but, not all, but, but, I, excuse me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So he addresses this phrase that they like to quote right there, but he does it again later on. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, he says this, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. So a favorite phrase of the Corinthian Christians was this, All things are lawful for me. In other words, all things are permissible for me. Because of my freedom in Christ, all things are available. They're basically saying, because I'm saved by grace, I can go out there and sin all I want. Because I'm free in Christ, I can choose to live however I want to live. Now, Corinth wasn't the only people dealing with this. The Romans were dealing with this too. Paul addressed this in Romans 6.1 where he writes this. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Their attitude was this. If, the, if we sin more and more, we're going to receive more grace. That's not the way it works, friend. 
You see, more sin doesn't provide you more grace, but more grace should provide an attitude that I want to sin less. That's how it works. Jude addressed this in Jude, Jude 4. He wrote this, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, look what it says, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. This is exactly what the Corinthians were doing. And it doesn't, it doesn't that sound like the, the American church today? I mean, we hear people say stuff like this. Hey, you live your life the way you want to live your life, and I'll live my life the way I want to live my life. Hey, don't you put your nose in my business, and I'll keep my nose out of your business. Don't you dare talk about my sin and point out my sin because you, you know, you're not to be my judge. After all, you sin as well. We hear stuff like that. We justify the way that we live. But Paul insists that the Corinthians weren't being tolerant. They were being arrogant. They weren't filled with love. They were filled with pride. If they truly loved Christ, and, and they truly cared about this brother in Christ, what would they do? Paul tells them in the latter part of verse 2, that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among them. He says the most loving, the most godly, the most gracious, grace-filled thing that you could do in a situation like this is to boot him out of the church. The answer is not tolerance. The answer was excommunication. Now, that's the end of a process known as church discipline. Some of y'all may, may not know what church discipline is. We're going to talk about that in just a moment, Lord willing, if we get to that point this morning. But that's the very last step of church discipline. You say, how is that going to help anything? Again, we'll deal with that in a moment. But the first point that we're talking about here is we've got to be grieved over sin. And within this first point, I want to share two truths with you. Now, this isn't point number two. This is just two truths within this first point about being grieved over sin. I want to share with you that we need to realize that we're truly going to be functioning like we should if we're going to respond to sin the right way within the church and within our lives. First off, here's the first truth I want to share within this first point. Some things we call grace aren't gracious at all. Some things that we call grace are truly not gracious at all. I mean, think about it this way. If you have a two-year-old and you let a two-year-old go out there and play on 501 because he wants to, and if, you throw, if, if, if you tell him not to, he throws a fit, so you let him to do it, would that be gracious? No, certainly not. Of course not. But some people say, well, that's what he wants, so I'm being gracious, so I'm going to give him what he wants. That's the problem with a lot of our younger generation nowadays today. Let's just be honest. You see, we allow, we encourage, we enable destructive, sinful behavior in our kids or even in our spouses or even in our, in our brothers and sisters in Christ when we're not being loving. We're not being truly gracious. We're actually being unloving and ungracious by allowing these things to go on. But in the church, we shy away from confronting people and we call it grace. We want to avoid unpleasant conversations and we call it grace. We want to refuse to hold people accountable, and we call it grace. It's like we say grace is just a big rug, and let's just sweep everything up under the rug so we don't have to deal with it. That's not the right way to deal with sin in the church, and that is not grace. By leaving people to their own sin or in their sin, it is not gracious at all. It is not loving at all because that hurts them instead of helping them, and that hurts their families, and that hurts the church, and that hurts the community around the church. Think about this. Jesus was by far the most gracious person who's ever walked on the face of this earth. Would you agree? Amen. Certainly he was. But do you realize this? He never left anyone in their sin. He confronted it and wanted to help them get out of their sin. Think about the woman at the well in John chapter, uh, excuse me, the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8. Now she's guilty. You know, they caught her in adultery. She's guilty. Literally guilty. Now most people will quote from that passage, what Jesus said to the hypocrites. In John 8, 7, he says, For he who is without sin among you, let him be the first one to cast the first stone. And we know how the story went. They all dropped the stones, they walked away. But what we do sometimes is we ignore what Jesus said to the woman. We ignore what Jesus said to the sinner. In verse 11 of John 8, he says, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The most gracious and loving person ever, the Lord Jesus Christ, notice what he does. He confronts her sin. He doesn't let her stay there and say, well, you know what? If that's what you want to do, I'm going to be gracious and let you stay there. No, he confronts it. And he forgives her her sin, and then he demands that she leave her sinful lifestyle. So grace does not leave a person in sin. Grace calls them out of that sin. A loving, gracious church will seek to do the same 
for its believers, for its members. So that's the, that's the first truth within this first point here, is that, is that you know, some things we call grace aren't gracious at all. But here's the second truth within this first point of talking about being grieved over sin. What we call grace is often a lack of grief over sin. Now look at verse 2. Paul says, you are puffed up and have not rather mourned. Now that word mourn is exactly what you think it is. Think about when a family member dies. This afternoon, Laura and I are driving to King, North Carolina. I shared some of this with you all Wednesday night. When I was in High Point, I was a youth and education minister there, and we had teenagers, and one of the teenagers passed away this week, 39 years old. His family is mourning. We want to go and be with his family and support his parents and his sister and, and, and her husband and their family. I've never met his wife, but meet his wife. It's exactly what you think. It is mourn over someone dying. This is, how, this is how we're to feel. This is how we're to react when a believer stays in their sin. When a believer refuses to repent of their sin. Paul says you should be grieving over this sin. You shouldn't be boasting about your tolerance of it. You see, what we call a surplus of grace actually is a lack of grief. When sin doesn't grieve us deeply, it can be looked over easily. And this is no big deal. Now, here's the thing. It does not require any grace to overlook sin if that sin doesn't grieve you. The thing about this, grace is amazing because of what it costs the person who gives you that grace. Grace is free to the receiver. We have all received grace from God freely, but think about what it costs God. It costs him greatly to give us the grace that we receive freely. It's only when we take sin seriously that we can give grace genuinely. We have to be grieving over sin, not just in other people's lives, but let's start with our own lives first. We have to be broken and truly grieve and mourn over the sin in our life. So grace deals with sin, and it offers forgiveness of sin, and it causes people to leave their sin behind. But if we never deal with sin, if we ignore it, if we condone it, that's not gracious at all. You see, if we're going to deal with sin in the church the right way, we have to first off be grieved over sin. So looking at your life, don't look around, don't think about anybody else. Here's what I want you to do. I just want you to look at your life this morning. Are you grieved over sin in your life? Is there any unconfessed sin in your life this morning you need to deal with? Are you grieved when you hear about a brother or sister in Christ living a lifestyle of sin? Does it break your heart for what they're going through? That's how the church should be. Now, I want you to see the second practice that we need to have in order to deal with sin within the church the right way. Number two, confront the sin. Not only should we grieve over the sin, but we have to confront the sin. Look at verse three here. For I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed. Paul says, look, I have judged this situation, and you should have judged it by now too. When another Christian in the church lives in obvious, unrepentant sin... We not only have a right, but we have a responsibility to judge that sin. In other words, to confront that sin in their life. You say, but Dave, I thought the Bible tells us not to judge. You know, don't judge lest ye be judged. Often Christians think no one has a right to confront them over their sin. That's not your job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. To which I say, read the Bible. It is the Holy Spirit's job, job, but it's also our job as brothers and sisters of Christ. I mean, th- Christians think that, that confronting them is, is condoning them. And that's not what it is at all. You're confronting them because you love them and you want change in their life. But people will quote that verse. Judge not lest ye be judged. How many times have I told you over the years context is key? You know the context of that verse? Many Christians don't. They just throw it out there. You, know, you can't judge me. Judge not lest ye be judged. Well, let's, let me give you the context of that verse so we can fully understand what Jesus means. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 7, and we're specifically going to read to you the first five verses. I want you to listen to the context of this of Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Jesus says this, Judge not that you be not judged. And that's where most people stop right there. He goes on to say, For with the judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, they might go that far, but then they stop right there. Well, let's continue on. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite! First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You see the greater context here? See, if if you only quote the first sentence there, that first verse, you're actually misquoting the whole passage here. 
Jesus is showing us that there always has to, there's always been religious people who felt it was their job to look for specks in people's eyes. It's not just today in 2024. Jesus dealt with people back there thousands of years ago that they were looking for specks in everybody's eyes. They love to find the little things in people's lives they can point out and point fingers at, but they never, never deal with the big things in their own life. They refuse to deal with it. That's what Jesus is talking about here. This is what he's saying. You have a plank in your own eye, but you're trying to help others. Let me ask you, if I had a big two-by-four sticking out of my eye, I know if I did, I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be alive. I mean, let's just be honest, two-by-four through my head. But let's just say I did. Would that hinder my ability to see and help someone else? Of course it would. But we do it all the time, don't we? We don't want to, ref- we don't want to deal with the, the plank in our own eye. We want to deal, pull the speck with tweezers out of someone else's eye. Jesus was, talking to, it was, Jesus was taking this issue with people who didn't practice what they preached. Remember, he calls them hypocrites. That's the definition of a hypocrite right there. You don't practice what you preach. These are people who are, <coughs> excuse me, these are people who are always pointing out the sins in other people's lives, but they're never dealing with the sin in their own life. They judge everyone else and their flaws, but they ignore the flaws in their life. And Jesus said that this kind of attitude is wrong, and this kind of attitude is to be avoided. But notice what Jesus does not say in this passage of Scripture of Matthew 7. He does not say, ignore the speck in your brother's eye because you shouldn't confront people. He doesn't say that. That's not what he says at all. In fact, it's just the opposite. He says, look, deal with your own sin so you can fairly, so you can accurately, so you can lovely deal with your brother's or sister's sin. Don't ignore the speck of others. Just make sure you remove that plank from your eye first. Confront yourself, Jesus says, before you confront others. Because then if you do it that way, you'll be doing it the right way. This is what Paul is teaching here. There is nothing, hear me on this, there is nothing unbiblical, there is nothing unloving, there is nothing ungracious about calling sin, sin. There is nothing unloving calling someone to repent of their sin. You love them when you call them to repent of their sin. If the church does not confront sin, God will judge the church, friend. But understand this, the Bible is our authority, not us. We're not the authority, the Bible is. The Bible passes judgment, not us. We just acknowledge that the Bible is true. We acknowledge the Bible is right. And we're not sitting in judgment over others. We're sitting in judgment underneath the Word of God. But because we love someone, we want to confront the sin in their life and help them get out of that sin. If we are going to deal with sin in the church the right way, we have to confront sin. Are you willing to confront sin? Start with your own life first. Before I ever confront sin in someone else's life, I have got to make sure I'm right with God. I've got to remove that four by four beam out of my own eye to remove the tiny little speck of dust out of their eye. It has to begin with me. But we have to be willing to lovingly and graciously do that in the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Are you willing to live that way, to confront sin? Finally, in order to deal with sin in the church the right way, number three, we need to practice church discipline. I told you we're getting there and we're here. We need to practice church discipline. You say, what is that? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to explain it to you. Don't worry, I'm not taking my belt off like my dad did to discipline me. Think about it this way. If a church member will not repent... If a church member will not remove their sin, that church member must be removed from the church until they see the error of their ways and they humbly repent of their sin. That's what Paul is getting at here in verse 5. And that's the very, like I told you, that's the very end of the process of church discipline. That's not where you begin. Look at verse 5 again. Paul writes, Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Wow. Bet you that's a verse you never memorized. Boy, that would encourage a brother or sister in Christ. Let me share a word of encouragement with you. 1 Corinthians 5 5. No. We don't want to avoid that. We want to avoid that verse. We don't want to hear that. But notice that word deliver there. Paul says, deliver such a one to Satan. That word deliver means to hand someone over to the proper authorities for appropriate punishment. That's the idea here. You know what Paul's saying? Fine. You refuse to repent. You refuse to get right with God. You're going to act like a child of the devil. We're going to give you over to the devil. You're acting like an unbeliever. We're going to treat you like one. Now, what does it mean to deliver such a one to Satan? Now, understand that God uses his church to teach truth. God uses his church to grow in grace and to keep us in his will, among many other things. 
But he is so sovereign, he is so powerful, that if his children will not respond to loving instruction by the church and loving care by the church to try to get someone to repent of their sin and, and get rid of the sin in their life, he will use, God will use painful devastation from Satan as a means of correcting that person. Why? The same reason you punish your kids when they disobey you and they refuse to repent. They refuse to get right. They refuse to obey because you love them. Paul tells, not Paul, excuse me, the writer of Hebrews tells us that God disciplines his children because he loves us. And here's the sad reality. If you're not disciplined by God, you know what that says? You're not his child. That's a salvation problem right there. So this isn't the idea of I'm going to hand him over to Satan because I'm done with him. That's not what God is saying. That's not what Paul is saying. This is the idea that I'm going to hand him over to Satan because he refuses to, to hear and do it the easier way to repent and get his life right with God. So since he won't respond to the easier way, guess what? You're going to learn it the difficult way. How many times did our parents do that to us? Huh? That's what God's doing here. That's what Paul's saying here. God can use the church or God can use Satan to do his work in the life of his people. You see, the church is used voluntarily. Satan does it unwillingly. But both can be instruments of God because God is that powerful. God is that sovereign that God will use what he needs to to bring about his redemptive purposes, to change his people's heart and to turn his heart, their hearts back towards him. God uses every means available to convict us of our sin and to turn us back towards him because he loves us that much. Now understand that this excommunication of the church, like I said, that's the last step of church discipline. Paul goes to that very last step because the situation has spiraled down so badly, has progressed past the first few steps that I'm going to share with you in just a moment here. But the removal from the church is to be a last resort. That is not the first step. Don't hear me and say, hell, oh, someone's sinning, you better not go there, they'll kick you out right away. That's not what I'm saying. Now remember, this is not sin that we struggle with. This is not, you know, I'm struggling with sin, I confess it, I repent it, and then down the road, I, I, I commit that sin again, I confess it, I repent it. This is someone who is living an open, blatant sin, and they don't care. That's who we're talking about. Everybody knows this is going on. So what are the first few steps of church discipline? What are the first few steps that we've got to take? Well, Jesus taught us this. Again, in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 18, Jesus taught us this in Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Listen to what he says. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. You're done. That happens. But he goes on if that doesn't happen. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen or a tax collector. You see the progression here? First, if you go one-on-one. -on -one. You find out a brother or sister in Christ is sinning publicly. They're unrepentant. They're just living like this guy, sleeping with his stepmother, and he didn't care. You go to them one-on-one. -on -one. Go to them privately. And the hope is they will repent and get right with God. But if they don't listen to you, they don't repent, what do you do? You take back two or three brothers or sisters in Christ with you. And if they refuse to listen to them and repent, then you take it to the leaders of the church. And then if they refuse to listen to the spiritual leaders of the church, you bring it to the whole church. And the church dismisses them, and they treat them like an unbeliever because that's how they are living their lives. Now, please hear me clearly. The goal of church discipline is not removal. The goal of church discipline is not removal. It is reconciliation. The goal of church discipline is not rejection. It is restoration. Paul talks about this in the, in the book of Galatians. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, he writes this. Brethren, if a man is overtaken any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. The goal is to restore him. Discipline is for the sake of restoration. Discipline is for the sake of reconciliation. So they get their life right with God, not to kick somebody out of the church. You see, sin left undisturbed in the church is going to contaminate the rest of the church. That's why this has got to be deal with, dealt with. You can't just let it go and sweep it under his rug. That's what Paul's getting at here in verses 6 and 7. Look what he says. Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Now the image here is that of the Passover supper. So think back to the, the Old Testament. The Jews were in Egypt. 
They were delivered from, from death by the application of the blood of the Lamb. Remember that? The death agent was coming, and, and they were told to put the blood of the Lamb on the doorpost. Remember? Over top the door and on the side. You see the foreshadowing of the cross? They were saved by the blood of that sacrificial lamb. And so following that application of the blood, the Jewish families ate the Passover meal. And one of the requirements was that there would be no yeast, there would be no leaven to be found anywhere in the house. Why was that? Leaven is a picture of sin. It's small, but it's powerful. It puffs up that dough, doesn't it? You ever done any bed breaking, bed baking, you you put yeast or leaven in that dough, what happens? You see that bread rise. It spreads throughout that bread. And so when the lamb was present, sin was to be gone. And that's how it should be in our life today. Jesus is the lamb of God who shed his blood to deliver us from sin. And we had the lamb present with us, so we should not have sin ongoing in our lives. Sin should be avoided, not aided. The sinning church member who refuses to repent is like a piece of that yeast, that leaven. And they defile the entire loaf. They defile the entire congregation. It spreads when it is undealt with. Sin in the church is like a cancer in the body, sad to say. It spreads, it contaminates, it affects people. It must be removed or nothing survives. It doesn't take a lot lot of it, does it? But it spreads through it all. And here's a sad reality. I've seen this happen in many churches. Well, that's just their business. We're not going to deal with it. That's between them and God. And the church begins to die. Because it spreads through the church. Human biblical church discipline is not easy. It is not popular. But it is so important to the life of the Christian. It's so important to the life of the church. And, and there's several things why it makes it so important. You see, it strengthens the local church. That we're going to stand on God's word and we're going to do what God's word says. We're going to handle things the right way, the biblical way, and glorify God. It honors the Lord Jesus Christ. It honors and glorifies God when we handle things the way the word of God tells us to do. Yes, it's not easy. Yes, it's not popular. But remember, the goal is not to kick someone out of the church. The goal is for them to get right with God. Restoration and reconciliation. That's the great blessing of this process of church discipline. It restores that wayward believer back to where they need to be. That's the goal. Let me just ask you. Are you willing to do what it takes to biblically deal with sin, even if it means church discipline? Now, hopefully church discipline never gets to that final step where we're bringing something before the church because that wayward believer has gotten right with the Lord. I mean, that's how it should be. But there may be a case where they refuse to repent. They refuse to get right with the Lord. They just keep on in their blatant, open sin where everybody knows about it. And it's brought to a church, and the church must decide what are we going to do with this brother or sister in Christ. God's word is clear. You treat them like an unbeliever. Are you saying that awful harsh? Sure it is. It's tough. But the goal even then is still restoration, not just to kick him out. The goal is that, that, as Paul said, turn him over to Satan. Why? So that his life or her life will be in such turmoil because they're out from beneath the protection of the church and they're beneath the protection of God and they've been turned over to Satan. So they're miserable that they can't help but want to run back to God and repent. Again, the goal is restoration. The goal is reconciliation. But we have to be willing to be biblical. And we pray that if we ever have to deal with something like this, we never have to get this far with it. So are you willing to do what it takes to handle sin the biblical way in the church? But here's the reality. It starts with ourselves. Remember, we've got to remove that plank out of our eye before I can pull that speck out of your eye. That's where it's got to start. We've got to be willing on a daily, multiple times throughout the day, let's just be honest, if you're like me, Yes, your preacher sins throughout the day, okay? And don't act like you don't. But when the Holy Spirit convicts us, we should want to immediately confess it and repent and get right with God right there. So we need to deal with ourselves first. Think about it this way. Where does a boat belong? It belongs in the water, doesn't it? 
Some of y'all have boats. You've probably been out on the boat uh, this weekend, maybe beautiful weather yesterday or been out previously. You're going to definitely be on the boat this summer. You know, it's good for a boat to be in the water, but the problem is when the water gets in the boat, doesn't it? That's kind of backwards, isn't it? you got a serious problem that needs, needs immediate attention. Anybody ever here ever forget to put the plug back in? And when you put it down the boat launch and all of a sudden it starts filling with water? Yeah, you got an immediate problem you better take care of right then. So let me ask you this. Where does the church right now belong? We belong in the world right now. Because God has told us to go out into the world and to make disciples. It's good right now for the church to be in the world making disciples. But the problem is when the ways of the world get in the church. And we need to address that problem. When we start living and thinking and, and making decisions and, and behaving like the way of the world without God in our mind. Let me be clear on this. God will not bless the church where there's open, blatant, unrepentant sin going on. God will not bless it. He said, how do you know? Like I told you, I've seen it. I've seen it. Let's just be honest. God has blessed Red Mountain Baptist Church. And let me just be clear on this, because I know how this is going to go, because the other Sunday, or a couple months ago when I was dealing on a passage earlier in 1 Corinthians, you know, uh, people were wondering, what, 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 what was the issue? Why, why are you so passionate about this? What divisions going in the church? There was nothing going on. So let me just be clear. There is nothing in my mind I know that we need to address in someone's life openly and publicly right now. You may think, whoo, he doesn't know. <laughs> I don't, but God does. And you need to deal with that this morning. So don't go out of here and say, you know, Dave's talking about so-and-so. No, I'm not. Because I'm being honest with you. There, there's not an issue going on that I think we need to bring into the process of church discipline right now. If there was, we'd do it. You say, well, 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 how do you know you do it? Well, the hope is you don't know. That the spiritual leaders of the church deal with it biblically and deal with it right, so you don't know that it ever happened. But that person's restored. But there's no person in mind I'm thinking of this morning. There's no circumstance in mind. What I'm doing is what I've said from the beginning of this series is I'm trying to help you guard our church, guard our unity that God has, so that God will continue to bless Red Mountain Baptist Church. This is another way for us to be on guard. I don't want to lose God's blessing, friend. We must deal with sin in the church the right way, this way, as it talks about in 1 Corinthians 5. Otherwise, God will remove his hand of blessing. But we've got to start with ourselves. So here's the challenge this morning. Because I told you, I don't know of a circumstance we need to deal with publicly. So let's take an individual. Are we grieved over the sin in our lives? Like we should be. Maybe that's where you need to start. Ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, is there any sin in my life that I've just kind of swept under the carpet that I'm not grieved over, that I'm not mourning over? Do we need to confront the sin in our life? If you've got sin in your life, the answer is yes. You need to confess and repent of and get right with God. Friend, if we don't deal with it individually, we won't have to well, let me just back up and say it this way. If you don't deal with it individually, it's going to spread. Because we'll become more and more accepting of it. We'll become more and more okay with things. And like that leaven, like that yeast, it will spread. And then we will have to deal with something publicly. Sad to say. If we deal with it individually, we won't have to follow this process of church discipline. But we need to be willing to handle things biblically. And it starts individually with us. Let's start by just dealing with our own selves this morning, ourselves. So I, I encourage you this morning, if there's unrepentant sin, the Holy Spirit's probably pointed out to you by now, don't sweep it underneath the carpet. Deal with it right now. Maybe right where you're sitting, if you're watching online, you want to come pray at the altar, you want me to pray with you, I'll be glad to pray with you. And let, let me be clear, just because someone comes down to the altar doesn't mean they're a big, bad, awful sinner. They just... You want to get humble before God for whatever reason. It may have nothing to do with this topic. Don't you dare think that because a man walks down here this morning and gets on his knees that he's sleeping with his mother-in-law. I mean, not his mother-in-law, his stepmother, excuse me. That's a fear people have. If I go down there and I talk to the pastor, they're going to think I'm doing this. I never do. And I hope you don't either. And don't let that fear hinder you because we're here to help. 
You just may be burdened about someone who is living in sin, that unrepentant child, that unrepentant parent, whoever it is. And you just want to lift them up before the throne of grace and ask God to break them so they can't help but repent and get right with Him. Because here's the reality of it. We all know someone in our life that way. Maybe a family member, maybe a friend, maybe a neighbor, whoever it is, co-worker. But we shouldn't just be burdened about our sin, we should be burdened about the condition of other people. That's where we need to start. And let me just encourage you this morning, if, if you never have dealt with the sin in your life, you never asked forgiveness of, of your sin and asked Jesus Christ to save you and to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior, let me encourage you to do so this morning. Again, I'll be down here at the front. I'll be glad to talk with you and pray with you. Father, thank you for letting me get through this passage. I was concerned with all these notes and so much you laid on my heart. But Father, this is a serious topic not one to be taken lightly. Lord, we want to continue to be the church that glorifies you, a church that lives by Acts 1-8, that reaches this community and all the way to the ends of the earth, like we talked about last week with Moldova. Father, I pray that sin will not creep in, the leaven of sin will not creep into our midst and cause your blessing to go away. Let us this morning deal with our own sin individually. If that's where we are. That we repent of it and get right with you. And maybe there's some people who, who have to deal with that and there's others who don't. You know their heart. I only know mine. But Father, maybe we're burdened also about someone else's sin. We know they're living in sin. We know they're living in disobedience to you and to your word. And we're broken over their sin. We should be. We should be grieving over the sin of not just ourselves but others as well. May we just lift them before the throne of grace and asking you to, to break them, Lord. Thank you for that sheep that you talked about, Jesus, where you, the shepherd has to break the leg to keep the sheep from running away. Lord, break them or break us if need be. And Father, I pray that we never have to get to the process in church discipline where we are bringing someone before the church to treat them like a non-believer. May we always deal with sin biblically in our own lives, but also as a church, Lord. And Father, for anyone who needs to deal with their sin this morning for the very first time, may they do that. May they ask Jesus to come into their life and to save them from the penalty of their sin and be their Lord and Savior. So Lord, whatever it is you're leading us to do in this time, may we glorify you by our obedience. We ask in your name, Lord God. Amen. As we stand and sing, let's re let us re all respond how the Holy Spirit is leading us this morning. <laughs>
Pastor Cameron is going to come and share some announcements with you. Well, again, if you're a guest, thank you for being here. And do take the Connect cards over to the foyer at the Welcome Center uh, right after I pray this morning. They do have a gift there for you. For you. Uh, please join us for a baby sprinkle honoring Jacob and Erica Bowers as they prepare to welcome baby Mason Scott. And there's a floating shower in the Family Life Center today from 2 to 4 p.m. And you're welcome to come to that. And we've been telling you we're going to be having a barbecue chicken plate fundraiser on Saturday, May the 4th. And all the money raised from that goes towards our upcoming missions. Uh, the plates are going to be $13 each, and they can be picked up at church between 11.30 and noon on the 4th. And you can sign up in the Welcome Center uh, for the number of plates you'd like to get. If you have any questions about that, you can just see me. And also, the Fun Bunch is going to be going to the Billy Graham Library on May the 6th. We're going to be leaving church at 7 a.m., so if you plan to go to that, we do need you to sign up in the Welcome Center as well, and you have any questions on that, you can see me as well. And our prison ministry is starting back up on Wednesday, May the 8th. We would love for you to be a part of the, this ministry at the Person County Jail. We're going to be leaving church at 7 p.m. that night, so if you plan to go, sign up in the Welcome Center and get a copy of your license to Wally or Sammy Watson no later than noon on Sunday, May 5th, so they can get you on the list. And our Graduate Recognition Sunday is Sunday, May the 19th. If you have a child that's graduating from high school or college, please submit a photo and a bio to Pastor Dave by tomorrow. He needs to have that by tomorrow. And uh, we are continuing to collect, as we've been talking about, for Annie Armstrong Eastern Offering and for North American Missions, and every penny does go to spread the gospel throughout North America. Our church goal is $3,400, so be praying about that. Uh, what would the Lord have to give? You've been very faithful so far, and we do have offerings, specially marked envelopes at the offering boxes, or you can give online. You just need to designate that to the Annie Armstrong Eastern Offering. So far, you've given over $2,600, so just... Thank you for that and continue to pray what the Lord would give there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you again for uh, just the faithfulness you've given to Pastor Dave, Lord, of bringing your word and keeping us on guard. Uh, you've blessed us so much, Lord, and such a wonderful family we have here, Lord, and we want to stay focused on you and on guard against those things that try to pull us away from you. So help us do that this week. We pray all this in your name. Amen. <laughs>